I was only 13 years old at the time, but I remember the moment as if it were yesterday. I was walking up the stairs at my house when somehow it occurred to me to take the big step, just right there halfway up the landing. There was nothing even slightly ceremonial about it. I didn't as much as close my eyes or even stop walking. For just a few seconds I slowed my pace and verbally asked God to forgive my sins and come into my heart. That was it. That was the pivotal point where, I guess, I was saved. But why then and there? Why not in response to an altar call upon a sudden swell of music with teary-eyed family members praying along with me? Why just standing there by myself on the steps hoping nobody in the living room would hear me? And why only then, after having spent 13 apparently unsaved years in a Christian home, church, and school? This moment, with all the questions surrounding it, is a pivotal point in the story of my long-running, often confused and tortured, relationship with God. Now that little story, strange as it sounds to outsiders, is probably familiar to a lot of you. You know all about asking Jesus into your heart, and even the idea of me as an 8th grader randomly muttering the prayer may be unsurprising to you. I mean, kids asking God for forgiveness over and over, just to be sure, is almost a trope of modern evangelicalism. Or at least it was in the circles I grew up in. But in this case, there's a lot more to it than that because that was the first time I remember praying the prayer of salvation. At the very least, it always stuck out as the time I got saved, and if I had ever uttered the words previously, it was in some rote, prompted way that I hadn't confidently internalized. So how did I get there? How did I make it all that way being, or at least feeling like, a non-Christian hiding in a church community? It's hard to say. I think part of it has to do with something I talked about in my previous video, which is the fact that Christianity was just always there for me, as natural a part of my environment as my home or my family. Since there was no clear dividing line when someone suddenly told me about Christianity and gave me the opportunity to choose it, it was easy to go a long time without, for lack of a better way to put it, getting around to asking Jesus into my heart. It wasn't that I didn't want to do it. I often desperately did. But I had trouble getting there for a couple reasons. First, it originally never even occurred to me to do it. In my youngest years, all I knew was that we were just part of a community of people who believed in God and loved Jesus and everything. The idea that a prayer of salvation separated the saved from the unsaved didn't even come up at first, at least as far as I remember. I mean, how would it, right? Are you going to put this into the head of a baby? A preschooler? A kindergartner? I mean, somewhere along the way it has to come up. But when? I guess other more structured religions, we'd have called them legalistic, went about it more systematically, maybe presenting you a clear choice at a certain age when you went through confirmation or something. But our brand of evangelicalism didn't have anything like that. I just have a fuzzy recollection of people gradually starting to allude to the idea when I was in early elementary school, and it didn't take full shape right away, because why you might not think of it, it actually involves several different concepts. That you pray to accept Jesus, that this involves asking for forgiveness, that this represents the moment you go from Christian to non-Christian, and that if you do it, you go to heaven, but if you don't, you go to hell. Growing up at church, I just kind of gradually picked up these ideas through osmosis, and by the time I'd fully received and grasped the entire teaching, it felt like I'd missed the boat on something we were all supposed to do and, so it felt, everybody around me must have already done. It was incredibly isolating. 
Before I realized it, the terms of belonging to the very community I had been born into had shifted through what probably amounts to an unintentional act of gaslighting. And then there I was, feeling like the idea of salvation had always been there and I'd always been an imposter. Second, I didn't really know how to do it. Sure, it sounds simple. Just pray to accept Jesus or whatever. But the entire concept of asking Jesus into your heart was so abstract I didn't even know what it meant. I mean, I could have uttered the words, but I would have just felt like I was going through the motions. Because something more than that was supposed to happen in your mind, right? You were supposed to feel some connection to and relationship with God. But I had no clue how to conjure that. And trust me, I really wanted to. I sincerely believed in God and wanted to know Him. And on top of that, I wanted to belong to the community of people closest to me whose identities were defined by love for Him. Not doing so made me feel deeply guilty. Also, oh yeah, there's the fact that I was going to be on fire for eternity if I didn't rectify the situation before I died. No pressure, right kid? But what do you do? Reach out to your parents? Or a teacher or a pastor? Well, when you're an elementary school kid, how do you go tell them that you've done literally the worst thing a person could do, which is to reject God and be unsaved? How do you articulate that you failed to do what makes you part of the community of believers? That you're secretly one of those people from among the world. I guess I could try to explain that I wanted to be saved but I didn't get it. But here's the issue with that. They had constantly drilled into our heads that salvation was a gift God freely offers us and chided us to reach out and take it. So questioning that would not only be contradicting the theology they taught us, not only pushing back against the clear instruction they gave us, but suggesting that God gave us insurmountably confusing instructions for avoiding hell and getting to heaven. I didn't know how to put all that into words, of course, but I had a very clear feeling that expressing my confusion was an affront to God and to the adults who told me to trust Him. Surely the problem had to be with me. So trapped in this no-win situation, I concocted a weird but kind of sad plan. I was going to do my best to stay alive until I became an adult, at which point I would try to find a church where nobody knew me and meet with a pastor to put everything on the table. I mean, if anybody could help me get it sorted out, it was a pastor, right? and I wouldn't get in trouble if I approached the pastor as an adult at a new church. Now I remember at some point taking solace in the idea that if I did go to hell, they'd display my entire life for everybody else to watch. Like in the Chick Tract, which is where I think I got the idea. And while that was meant to scare you with the shame of the whole thing, my takeaway was that I could sit and wait out the entire span of my life all over again before being sent to hell. Maybe other people's too, depending on how it worked. And at that age, that seemed to kick the problem down the road far enough to be some relief but I don't think I parked there long. The point was definitely to stay alive until I could find that elusive pastor. And did I ever develop a neurosis about staying alive? I was alert to every possible thing that could kill me in childhood, to the extent that I'd regularly drink two to three glasses of water before bedtime because my science book said to drink five glasses a day and I took that to mean that if I didn't I might die in my sleep and wake up in hell. I was confident I'd casually gotten enough water over the course of the day that a few glasses at bedtime should cover me. But then there was this one night when I was sure I'd actually met my end. A volcano had erupted in the Aleutians, blowing ash all over our community. It occasionally happens in Alaska, and of course they say not to go outside too much and definitely not to exert yourself. But one night I and some other kids forgot and went out to play after church until some adults came and chased us back inside. By then, however, it was too late for me. I had already run around breathing heavily and licking snow off my fingers. That night I remember going to bed thinking, well, this is it. Between inhaling ash and eating it off the snow, I must have done myself in. I'm sure I was scared, but the main thing I remember is having a weirdly peaceful sense of resignation about it. More than anything else having a bittersweet feeling about saying goodnight to my life and to my family who I wouldn't see in heaven. Along with the fear, I experienced a growing feeling of being out of place or inadequate within my community. From the time I was young, there was always some kid who had a dramatic salvation experience, or started speaking in tongues at five years old, or was praised by adults for the intensely emotional faces they'd make during worship. For these kinds of behaviors, they were held up as exemplars of what we should all be. And it probably goes without saying by this point that I just wasn't good at most of that stuff. I definitely wanted to be more like that. I really tried. 
but I just didn't have whatever intuitive internal mental skill set lets someone generate emotions through experiences like singing in prayer and project those feelings onto an abstract character, or to sense that the character is speaking back to you. It seems like the kind of thing that just worked for some kids. Something inside them just clicked, and they really felt they were experiencing God. Other kids, I'm pretty sure, knew how to mimic the signs of it and did so to get a pat on the head. I guess most did it for an unconscious combination of both reasons. But for my part, I wasn't willing to fake it and didn't know how to really feel it. Sure, church songs might be a little fun or emotional for me at times, but I generally found them boring and standing up for them got uncomfortable. Extended prayer, seeing as it involved sitting still with my eyes closed for long periods of time trying to talk to someone who didn't talk back, was usually just dreadful. I mean, seriously, how many elementary school kids really want to do that? Now, I'm sure this is one of the many parts where some Christians will jump in and say, aha, it was an attitude problem on your part, and use that as evidence that I was never saved or whatever. If that's you, I guess have at it. You're not my concern right now. I'm talking to people who experienced similar things to help them see they weren't alone. And the simple fact is, I wasn't rejecting God. I mean, if that was the point, I could have faked it to get on everybody's good side, right? But it's the very fact that I wanted to actually know God that held me up, because I was waiting for it to happen for real. I was trying to make it happen for real, and somehow it just didn't click for me. This led me to occasionally being put on the spot for being different. I remember in sixth grade I was the only one left in my class who couldn't speak in tongues, which got pretty awkward. I mean, I could fly under the radar as an unsafe person, but with tongues you're forced into a dilemma. Either knowingly fake babbling noises, which I wasn't going to do, or stick out like a sore thumb for not doing it. This might not sound like a big deal to a lot of you, but in that part of Christianity, speaking in tongues meant you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, which was a necessary progression toward maturity as a Christian. Sure, you might squeak by into heaven without it, but you were operating without the Spirit's power and essentially choosing not to progress in your Christian walk. Basically, you were what they called a lukewarm Christian and so I guess that's more or less what I was viewed as, at least by people who didn't wonder whether I was even saved. For the most part, this problem was just quietly understood or addressed with passing questions, but then it really came to a head one day when our school was on a retreat at our church's camp. I remember it very clearly. Our fifth and sixth grade class was sitting in a circle a few yards up the base of a mountain, I think because all the classes had splintered off with their teachers for some kind of devotional time, And before long, our teacher kept asking me about my lack of tongue speaking, basically trying to get to the bottom of what was going wrong. With the whole class sitting there staring at me, she pressed me to answer questions about things like what God means to me and so on, because I guess if I wouldn't accept the Holy Spirit, he didn't mean enough to me or something. I mostly just remember sitting there in awkward silence. I think eventually I tried to fumble for some kind of answer, but really, what are you supposed to say in that moment? I don't even remember how it ended. I probably disassociated out of sheer embarrassment or something. The pressure wasn't just on me. There was a general expectation that all of us students, elementary through high school, be really serious about our relationship with God, which led to a lot of developmentally inappropriate expectations of children's behavior. If you experienced normal levels of distraction during prayer or worship, it wasn't just a disruption. It wasn't just considered disrespectful to the teachers. It was a sign that you didn't care much for God. That was a heavy thing for kids to carry. With not enough regard for age and absolutely no regard for personalities, learning styles, or general restlessness, we were expected to spend often huge spans of time singing worship songs or sitting still with our eyes closed for prayer. And being still and orderly, daunting as that was, wasn't enough. If a teacher looked at you closely enough, you had to show some level of expressiveness indicating that you love God and his presence. It was terribly uncomfortable. Depending on the kid, you simply didn't know how to make adults happy. I sure didn't. These expectations largely came from a disconnect between what the church believed and what was evidently happening. They thought God was clearly manifesting, so to them it made sense that kids should be still and enjoy his presence. But, so it seems he wasn't manifesting in any clear way. So since the Bible was just a book and God's presence was just an ethereal feeling in our heads, who were we interacting with? The adults in charge. Who were we trying to please? The adults in charge. They were the authority structure, the personality behind Christian teaching. 
God's commands were their commands. Our relationship with God arose from and was entwined with parts of our relationship with them. And when you disappoint God, it's usually because you're disappointing adults in your life, whether it's an adult standing in front of you or one who lingers in your head. Hell, to this day I still feel an attachment to parts of Christianity and to the idea of God because it's largely an attachment to adults who had been a big part of my childhood. So when these adults set the rules, establish the theology, and develop a relationship with you, then turn you loose to sit by yourself and enjoy the company of what amounts to an invisible stranger get disappointed in you when you somehow don't, your emotional and relational bearings can get thrown off pretty badly. This fed into the distress I felt when I couldn't conjure a relationship with God and eventually helped shape the kind of relationship I did have with Him. Now in spite of all this, I eventually did make Christianity work. I can identify three watershed moments in this process. First was the salvation experience I talked about at the start of this video. Somehow, I'm not sure what finally made it work, I managed to utter a prayer of salvation and feel like it meant something. That was vital because it removed any periodic anxiety about salvation and let me try to find my footing as a believer. Second was when I finally had an experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. This came during my junior year in high school. One night I was praying in my room, it was a habit I had though not a super regular one, when the experience started feeling really intense. If you were ever a praying Christian, you probably know what I mean. Using what amounts to meditation, you slow your mind, which can make you feel peaceful and occasionally lead to surges of emotion. There's also a feeling of intimacy in believing you're sharing that moment with God, along with the relief that comes from working up a feeling you've been taught you should feel but can't always conjure. It's complicated. Anyway, as my prayer got intense, and my big, long-standing spiritual shortcoming lingered in my mind, I suddenly opened my mouth and just kind of let myself make utterances. When I did, my mouth seemed to move naturally, by reflex. I didn't feel like I was choosing sounds. They just came out. At that moment, I was shocked to realize that I wasn't faking it. That I was actually, truly speaking in tongues. Suddenly, a warm energy, almost a shock but a pleasant one, ran down my spine. Of course, in that moment, I saw it as a supernatural feeling, like the Holy Spirit running through me or whatever. Because how else are you going to interpret it when you're hyped in that mindset? But in hindsight, I recognize it was more likely just a surge of emotional release. Which makes sense, right? Not only was I having an intense moment of prayer, but after all those years of feeling like a non or partial Christian, of being puzzled by how to speak in tongues, I'd had the breakthrough. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. If you think of how cathartic that moment would feel, of the pent-up issues I suddenly thought were resolved, of the heavy shame that was suddenly off my back, a euphoric surge that feels like energy seems almost inevitable. Now I know not all of you can relate to the specifics of the speaking in tongues part of my story, but I think it typifies a struggle a lot of people have to make Christianity work. The third was also in my junior year of high school. I'd switched to a new Christian school for a variety of reasons, and there I met a guy who was like super into Christianity. He was always talking about Bible study and prayer and could be counted on to say something slightly uncomfortable if peers were doing something wrong or even seem more excited about worldly things than spiritual things. If you grew up in Christianity, you probably know the type. I think I was that type for a little while. Anyway, he got a bunch of us to start a prayer group before school. We'd occasionally circle up for group prayer, but we mostly spread out and prayed silently by ourselves kneeling against the pews. I think we usually did it for between a half hour to an hour. Over time, people started trailing off, because of course, I mean, we were high schoolers, but I stuck with it, and by my senior year, it was just me doing it off and on after the other guy went to another school. I mean, I won't lie, it was more off than on. I mostly liked to play basketball every chance I got. But I voluntarily prayed more than most Christians ever do, and a surprising amount for a high schooler. That was huge to me. The feeling of confidence that I was saved had been one major thing I was missing, but it wasn't just that. Even after I had my ticket to heaven, I still wanted to feel connected to God, to feel like I was enjoying His presence. In that large, dark, empty auditorium before school, I found a place where I could consistently still my thoughts and utter words, either whispered or in my mind, that I felt I was addressing to God, and get the impression that He was hearing me and responding. The response was more in the form of impressions or waves of emotion than of coherent words, 
and the strings of words I did hear were brief, arising subtly and trailing off gradually without expressing anything much more sophisticated than the reassurances I was expecting. But the interaction was happening. I felt that I was communicating with God, and I was able to engage in the experience regularly. More importantly, I wanted to engage in it. I'm not sure how much I wanted it because I enjoyed the moments of quieting my mind in a peaceful place and how much of it was the euphoria of feeling I was the complete kind of Christian I had previously failed to be. But regardless, that huge gap in who I was as a Christian was filled. Whatever was broken in me that made me feel bored by prayer in elementary school was fixed. I desired God and had a relationship with Him. So what was actually going on in my mind? That's a big question, but it seemed that I was letting two kinds of thoughts flow through my head. First were words I was speaking to God, which I spoke or thought deliberately as my act of prayer. That much is pretty straightforward. Second were words that popped up sporadically in what was essentially a very calm brainstorming session. If I sat at peace and thought godly thoughts, words would start to arise in my mind. I'm sure I myself had produced them unconsciously, and I half-consciously guided them where I thought they should go. But if I were sufficiently unintentional about forming them, if they arose from a wandering rather than a directed mind, I could feel like they were appearing in my head instead of being formed there. My ability to do this was finally enough to convince me I was speaking to and hearing from God. Looking back, it's strange how much of my sense of being a good person came from my ability to perform this internal exercise, and it's sad how much I had previously felt like a bad or incomplete person because I was incapable of making it click in my head. For me, that's in the past, but I feel horrible for all the children who are twisted up inside, who feel the disapproval of their loved ones because they're not able to produce such an abstract process and convince themselves it's them loving an immaterial being. There's not too much more to say about this as I progressed into adulthood. I experienced the same encounters with God off and on over time as, like many evangelicals, I had to discipline myself to maintain the kind of prayer and devotional life I thought I should have. Sometimes I didn't get around to it, and sometimes I struggled to feel God, which is very common. Churches even have a vocabulary for it, with many describing things like a dry time in their spiritual walk. But the story I told in this video pretty well lays the groundwork for this specific thread in my Christian life. The only thing that sticks out as different is that it was during the most difficult times in my life that I most intensely experienced what I perceived as God's love. And even after I had started to experience doubt, Major life crises often push me back to a more intense practice of Christianity. Does this mean God just reached out to me when I most needed him? That traumatic experiences caused me to humble myself and now that life's better I'm rejecting him out of pride? I guess some believers will default to this as surely as they default to someone must have hurt you if I'd fallen away during dark times. It's darned if you do and darned if you don't with that type of person, so whatever. But as I look back at these various experiences, they seem easily accounted for by natural surges of emotion which I was trained to understand within the framework of Christianity. Since experiencing God is a good thing, and something's wrong with you if you don't do it, you're pretty motivated to connect the dots. To interpret various levels of peace or euphoria as coming from an outside source that loves you, and to see the lack of them as a struggle to overcome. And when are you going to experience this more intensely than during emotionally extreme parts of your life? Now I can't know exactly what happened in my mind, but this is the best way I can sum it up. I certainly can't prove this is all that happens in the minds of other Christians, but this seems like a very likely alternative to the idea that a God speaks to the insides of people's heads in intangible ways that are most reliably conjured using natural meditative experiences, and that in the process he tells them a lot of inconsistent things. In the end, my point's not to falsify other people's perceived experiences of God. I just want to make it clear what mine was to show that it was a real experience that I sincerely sought, that I now honestly understand it as something other than what I originally thought it was, and that this is a reasonable interpretation of my experience as a Christian. Many believers will probably interpret my relationship with God as having been false all along or something I currently misunderstand or mock, but it's my story told as honestly as I can tell it, and if you can hear it with an open mind, maybe you can add something, however small, to your understanding of how religious experiences can work within a person's mind and where former believers are coming from. Thank you for listening.
This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, Daniel Bostet, Magnus Holmgren, Precipitating Pisces 250, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.